We are recording tonight's event, and I want to thank KPASS for being here tonight. Um, for those that are not able to attend, we'll be able to post a recording of this so people can learn and participate in the process moving forward. Um, I was uh, mentioning another committee that's giving us a lot of help that I wanted to thank. It's a technical oversight committee. A little bit louder? Thanks. The technical oversight committee is made up of some subject matter experts that will help um, review structural methodologies and give advice on the design process moving forward. And we're grateful to them. Pasadena Heritage has seats on both of those committees. And we're very grateful to Pasadena Heritage for walking arm in arm with us as collaborators on this project, uh, who are helping us make sure that we really do protect the historic character of this building. So thank you, Pasadena Heritage. Um, there are a couple of library support groups I'd like to acknowledge tonight. Our friends of the Pasadena Public Library, some representatives are here with us tonight. They sponsor many library programs and I'd like to thank them for being so resilient. Um, they've lost their home at Central Library and are waiting for us to have a classroom ready for them to move in here. And we're looking forward to, to welcoming them here at Jefferson soon. Also grateful to the Library Foundation who was formed many years ago and help us with their generosity and their wisdom in capital improvement projects at Central Library. And they will be essential for helping us through this project that we're facing right now. So we're very grateful to the foundation too. I'd like to thank the library staff who have been amazingly um, innovative and resourceful as they've found new ways to deliver services and do that in an outstanding manner um, through a period of very rapid change. Um, all of our neighbor liber neighborhood libraries are still open and I invite you to visit those. We've got copies of our newsletter here. Take a look and see what's happening. You will be impressed. There's a lot going on in our libraries. Uh, in the meantime, we are devastated by the closure of Central Library. Uh, it's temporary. We will be back open. We will, be, we will open up those doors again when this project is, is done. But um, in the meantime, we need your help. And that's the last group I need to thank. All of you, thank you for being here tonight. We need to hear from you. How do you use the library? What could we do better so that um, we can get you back in the library and meet your needs for the next 100 years and attract any potential library visitors that weren't coming before? What enhancements can we make to the library to, um, to bring us into the next 100 years um, while preserving the historic character of this building? Um, the goal tonight is for you to leave with a better understanding of this project. We want you to know the history of the building, the reason for this project. Can't wait for you to meet our design team. You'll be very impressed. Know how you can participate in the, this process and what the next steps are moving forward. If you leave with all of that information, we'll have achieved a lot tonight. So I really want to thank you for that. For that. Um, we have a project website. So if you want to learn more or tell your friends about it, it's pasadenapubliclibrary.net and click on the Central Library Project link. That's www.pasadenapubliclibrary.net to learn more. And we'll continue to update that site as we have more information to share and we get deeper into this, this project. I have the best job in Pasadena. I'm so fortunate that whenever I tell somebody what my job is, they will tell me a story about their history at Central Library, when they used the library, when their grandparents took them there to learn how to read, when they studied for their graduate degree. I even know a couple that got engaged at Central Library. A lot of wonderful stories. And that fabric of, of holding the community together is something that all together, we're gonna make sure we work and preserve and open up this library again. Um, uh, uh, in the very near future, we hope. Um, like I, I, it's my great pleasure to introduce the next speaker tonight. Chris Markarian is the Deputy Director of Public Works, who's a key member of this team. She's gonna talk um, and, int and introduce the design team. Most of the program tonight will be the design team speaking directly to you. We'll have some time for questions and answers at the end too, and I'll hang around too if you'd like to talk to me afterwards. So. Thanks again for coming, and I'm gonna introduce Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me all right? I don't have quite the loud voice that Tim does. But uh, 
So I'm part of the Department of Public Works, and as an engineer, I oversee the engineering division. We are in charge of delivering the design and construction of all of our capital improvement projects. So by way of background, um, about in 2021, we were looking at uh, assessing the building systems of our beloved Central Library. We, it was nearing its 100 year mark and we wanted to take a look and see what the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire sprinkler systems, want to make sure that if uh, the condition, uh, what the condition looked like and whether capital improvements were needed so we can plan accordingly and make sure that the library extends its life for at least another 100 years to come. And at that point, we also conducted and performed uh, some uh, evaluation of the structural system, and we found that the construction of the building was the unreinforced masonry, and that's the reason thereby, because it does not have the, uh, you know, the, the required, based on what we know today, in 1925, when this was built, it was very different times uh, when it comes to earthquake engineering and design. So not having the reinforcement in the wall or the fact that um, the system, the wall and the floors are not tied together, there were certain concerns and for that reason, for the safety of our public, the community that uses it, I believe uh, I learned, I've been learning a lot about our libraries and I learned that there's close to 900 people that visit the library is that week yeah. daily <laughs> daily oh, yeah yeah. Daily. yeah that's okay a thousand daily so that's that was very eye opening for me and uh so f from that point on we've been working alongside with our city council members who are uh in you know strong support of us looking to design and deliver this project as soon as we can and reopen the library. With that, we hired on a senior project manager dedicated to the project, so, uh, and also have been working in partnership with the library, all of the stakeholders that Tim previously mentioned. And, and of course, this being our first step in the early design phase is to listen to you and to take a look at what your needs are for our community moving forward into the future. And really this is the first of several meetings to come and additional dialogues that we're looking forward to uh, interact with the community, with you. And uh, from there, that will help us develop uh, a library, not just in its building systems, but also in programming and, and function that's going to be exceeding and enhance what we have today. So that's our intent. And we went through a very thorough, robust, uh, what we call uh, advertising for services, professional services to put together the best architectural engineering team that's gonna work in an integrated, uh, collaborative way to take a look at all the building systems, including the retrofit and the programming and the space planning, all the way down to lighting and sound. Uh, so with that, as we went through with the interview panel and uh, evaluated several teams that had proposed of professionals, uh, it was a unanimous choice by the, our interview panel to pick Gruen Associates. Gruen is a local firm. They have a lot of history uh, working on other libraries. They know the function of a library in addition to all the, uh, the technical aspects of the building and the need for the retrofit. And uh, with that, I want to introduce to you the uh, partner of Gruen, who is also the project manager on this 
for this project. She has over 30 years experience with the company and um, she will also be introducing the overall team. We have, I believe, more than a dozen sub-consultants, each with their own um, area of expertise who will be working collaboratively on this project. So, Deborah. So, thank you all for being here today. Let's see if we can move this thing along. All right, this is a, a brief a little presentation outline. You've already heard the welcome, and uh, you're about to hear the introductions, the reason for the project, and, uh, and a little overview of who we are, so you have some context for who we are. Uh, talk a bit about the evolution of this building over time, and uh, heads up. Hasn't evolved that much, but uh, we'll, we'll tell you that in a second. Uh, review of the building and uh, talking about its current programmatic uses. And then really, that's all a build up to getting your input. So getting your input on what we should be looking to do in this building is really critical. And we've got some questions we're gonna post all of you just so you know as we do. And then we'll talk about what our next steps are. This is the first of, of several of these meetings, as Chris said. Um, just to further outline the reasons for the project, certainly the seismic became the number one. As soon as the uh, building had to be closed because of its URM, uh, the unreinforced masonry uh, discovery, we uh, put that at the top of the list for things that we have to solve. But it's certainly not in isolation. So we need to improve the seismic performance of the building. Uh, but we also want to do it in a manner that um, is balanced with some of or all of these other needs. So uh, we need to make the building really look at its life safety uh, attributes um, and the ability for people to safely get out of the building should there be uh, an incident. Uh, we want to do this all in the context of preserving the great historic uh, character of this building. It's a, a true gem, uh, it's an icon in the city, uh, part of a, a district, uh, part of a historic district, and it's very important that everything we do uh, at the end of the day that those characters are, are maintained through this. Uh, the building is not, unfortunately, very accessible. Uh, so uh, I recently uh, had knee surgery. Very hard for me to get in and up and around. And uh, that's a temporary condition for anyone with small children or other mobility challenges. Uh, we really need to do something to help uh, improve uh, access in and through the building. And uh, we want to enhance the function of it. It's not just what it was 100 years ago, but what should it be in the next 100 years? What, what are really the the things, the events, the programs, the functions that this building uh, will want to have as we move forward. Again, we want your ideas on that. Um, and uh, we, through doing that, we want to have the flexibility. It's going to change again. Um, so the, we'll, we'll have this building open up and have uh, one set of functions, but in 40, 40, 50 years, you know, things will change again. So how do we make it flexible enough that uh, the building can adapt with uh, whatever the facility changes want to be. And then uh, modernization, Chris mentioned this. We need to make sure that all those building systems are, are up to snuff, that they're performing well, that they're as energy efficient as they can and should be, and that they're really serving the needs of this building. So um, first, a little bit about who we are. Um, this is uh, our firm. Uh, and I'm joined here by one of my partners, Larry Schlossberg, and uh, uh, one of our principal associates, Devin Burns, who are helping me lead this project. I want to point out a couple other members of our team. Uh, Sonny Duong, you might have met as he walked in. He's in the back. And Richard Solis, who is one of our key staff working with us on this project. Um, and uh, Gruen Associates, we've been around for not quite as long as the library, 77 years, but it's uh, you know, a fair amount of time. And we're landscape architects, urban designers, and architects. So this type of building is uh, something that we really relish the opportunity to work on. Um, one of the things that we do really, really well is work on complex civic buildings and uh, bring them new life. And uh, and so that is what we will be doing for you here. Uh, we also have, as Chris mentioned, a very large uh, and complex uh, consultant team. And uh, we are joined here by several members of our team, so I want to give them a little shout out. Aldrin Aru from KPFF, who is our structural engineer. 
Uh, John Lacasio from Historic Resources Group, who is our historic preservation uh, consultant, and Kerry Chesteen from SAFOS, who is doing the environmental work. And uh, we can talk, uh, uh, make all those folks available to you to talk to uh, at the end of this as well. And uh, then you can see from this list, a lot of other disciplines go into uh, making uh, this a robust project. I do want to mention a, a few other things just uh, so that you take note of it. The city also has some consultants that uh, they've brought on board and uh, they're doing certain things like scanning the building and the geotech work. But they also brought on a peer review structural engineer, Nabi Youssef and Associates. And uh, we mentioned that just because it just shows you the depth to which this broader team of the city and our team are going to really make sure that what we're doing is the right thing for this project. Uh, just really briefly, I wanna show you a few projects that we have done in the past, just to give you some context. This is a project that was completed uh, almost a decade ago at this point. Um, the uh, Brand Library and Art Center in uh, Glendale, just up the road. Uh, a uh, slightly older building, about 20 years older than this, than the Pasadena Central Library. Uh, it was built in uh, the early uh, 100s, uh, uh, 1900s, uh, 1907, I believe. Um, also needed to be seismically upgraded. Also needed to have um, some preservation uh, attention to it, modernization, all of the same components. Much, much smaller library, but uh, we thought we'd share that with you. Uh, it won a, uh, an award from the Los Angeles Conservancy for its uh, efforts in uh, being a good preservation uh, example. Uh, another one, much different, also historic, uh, strangely enough, not listed yet, but uh, designed to be listed. This is the Central Library in Glendale, which uh, is a brutalist building done in the 1970s, and uh, the city of Glendale considers this to be uh, you know, really important building to preserve as a historic building. So even though it wasn't listed yet, we treated it as a historic building, brought on Historic Resources Group to help us, and also won a, a Los Angeles Conservancy Award for this building. Um, <coughs> about the same size as uh, Central Library, coincidentally. Uh, and then lastly, uh, Tower Theater, which is not a library. <laughs> it's uh, a Tower Flag, uh, an Apple flagship store. It's a uh, an old movie theater that was adaptively reused to be a tower, a, an Apple flagship store. Uh, otherwise, you would call it a store. Um, but uh, Apple calls it a flagship. Um, but it, it's a really beautifully uh, preserved building that was uh, in, in very different shape when we got there. And uh, the fact that we were able to uh, really bring out its uh, character uh, bring it back to life and uh, preserve all the things that were really critical. Again, with historic resources help, um, you know we're we're very proud of. And uh, not to sound uh, redundant, but also we won an award for that one. So uh, we're not that we're looking for awards as much as that's a recognition of the nature of of these projects and how we approach them, and that we really take the preservation of them very seriously, but they also can have a new life, a very robust new life in the course of doing that. And uh, let me ask Devin to talk about the evolution of the building. So all old buildings have a lot of history. And so digging into some of these old buildings, we get to dig deep. Um, if you guys didn't know, 1927, Myron Hunt designed um, the Pasadena Central Library. It is on the National Register of Historic Landmarks. Um, many of the building systems are actually original <laughs> that we're digging in and finding out. You have to talk a little louder. Okay, sorry. This better? Okay. I'm getting. I feel so close to this microphone. Um, the original construction is, as you see here, uh, the the south side, the courtyard, was the main entrance. There was a loading dock on the north side, where now many of you probably enter from. What was interesting when we start digging into the old uh, blueprints is that he had actually designed these other wings off to the east side that you see here um, that were not built. And then in the stacks area, that central area, um, 
that area was designed um, to have more levels, but at this time it was only one level. So 1966, uh, you saw these extra wings added, not, not per his original design, but somewhat different. And then the story room next to the, ki the children's hall. In 1984 is when uh, it appears the north entry uh, became the main point of entrance. And then the stacks uh, were added, those four levels added that you see now. Uh, here are some pictures of the 1984 uh, construction that was going on uh, in that area. Um, other things that we love digging up, we love studying old photographs and kind of, you know, picturing what what's different. Um, so it was interesting uh, when HRG brought up uh, these series of the Central uh, Circulation Hall uh, that the the lamps changed throughout the decades and then went back uh, to the original, and that's what's up there right now. Uh, what, right now, we're also digging into special historic uh, elements of the space and making sure we're documenting and um, preserving those. Another interesting aspect, what we talked about, were some of the systems in the building. Um, they use the cavities in these walls uh, for the air, and so that's something that we do want to preserve because that's a somewhat character-defining feature with these uh, uh, bookshelves that you see throughout uh, most of the main halls. And then I will have Larry come talk about some of the building design. So uh, the circulation hall, which I'm sure many, if not all of you, are familiar with, um, photo taken right when the library opened. Thank you. <laughs> and um, a, a more recent photo. And the hall has changed very little. Um, most of what has changed is the position of, of the desks in the center of the hall. Those are no longer there. But uh, really all of the historic features. Use your outdoor voice. Okay, all of the historic features continue to remain, and they will remain. The Humanities Hall, um, off of the main hall, also very similar, practically the same as it was when it was originally built uh, in 1927. And really a, a, a striking feature of the library is the interior woodwork. Um, it, it extends throughout the library, is really finely crafted, and really sets the tone for the, the quality and the character of, of the library. At the exterior, uh, the, the grounds were thought out um, as much as the interior of, of the library. The landscaping is, is formal, um, mature trees. You see in the center the entry courtyard, uh, which creates uh, uh, several outdoor spaces for all kinds of uses at the library and the, sort of a grand procession to, to enter the library. So as was mentioned, there are some accessibility challenges uh, to the building. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, uh, it's difficult to enter the building uh, if you can't use stairs. In, in green, you see all the sort of paths to the front of the building, but they all involve currently stairs, and we're going to fix that. At the north entry, which is probably currently the, the most used entry, and it was originally the loading dock for the building, uh, there is an accessible entry, a, a, uh, a wheelchair lift, uh, which we do not find elegant enough or, or provides uh, sufficient dignity to those who need to use it. So we intend to provide a more direct and, and pleasant entry for the disabled. As I was also mentioned, uh, finished just a few weeks ago, there was a 3D model scan produced of the library inside and out uh, with 
computer scanning equipment brought into the library and a 3D model created within the computer. And we will be using this throughout the process so that um, we are working in three dimensions on what is actually there. This is an example of, of the kinds of things the three, 3D modeling software is able to do. This is a section through the main hall and the stacks. And we can cut sections and floor plans and look at details however we like. So the, the current um, programmatic use of the library is, is sort of summarized in, in this image is going bottom to top. This is the, the basement level. Um, perhaps many of you have never, been, never even been down there. Much of it is devoted to you know, mechanical space, building, building services space, but also currently houses some stacks or the, the bottom of the, of the main stacks. Some offices, the Internet co uh, Commons, Copy Center, and, and, and so on. This level also, or the basement level, also has a, a number of different floor levels that we are looking at uh, evening out and, and making it fully accessible. Maybe even some expansion of this space within crawl spaces uh, uh, or unoccupied spaces of the, of the basement currently. The main level, ground level, that I'm sure you all are familiar with, um, the lighter blue being all the sort of publicly accessible areas. Uh, you're familiar with the main hall and the courtyard, and then the, the various uses off of it, the children's room, the auditorium, reference, reading room, and such, and of course the stacks. In purple are back of house spaces, uh, spaces where the library staff does their work, and probably the public doesn't, doesn't often see. The second level, um, much smaller than the first level, also has stacks, and then there's two more levels of stacks on top of that, and then some other back of house spaces for library administration, employee lounge, and, and such, and these two balcony spaces at each end of the, of the great hall, which are really fantastic, and, and we need to look at how to make them accessible. Third level, which is at the, the top of the stacks, is where the, the teen facilities are and the studio room, multi-purpose room for um, lectures, for, for all art, all kinds of things. And a couple of other um, really fabulous spaces at the ends of the main hall that uh, have these sort of wonderful overlooks over, over uh, the main hall, but are also currently not accessible, something we need to work on. So the, the programming effort, as Tim mentioned, um, the project started out with a, a visioning pr uh, report prepared by the, the community programming committee. And this was uh, both sort of overall vision goals for what the uh, renovated li library might be like, and also in included some important details. And the committee was made up of community members of, of former library commission members, academics, other librarians from, from, from other libraries, really a, a, an expert committee. And the main goals that were reflected in, in the visioning report were, of course, to maintain the historic character of the building, um, but design those spaces for 21st century use. Libraries have changed a lot in the last 100 years, both in technology and how libraries are used. The much wider uh, uh, program of services are, are offered in, in libraries now than, than 100 years ago. Of course, make improvements to accessibility and create new spaces that could never have been anticipated 100, 100 years ago, like maybe a, a maker space, uh, expand innovation lab remain true to the mission of a library as a public serving institution. And what we're doing now, engage with the community and the library staff for further uh, programmatic analysis. We have been, over the last several weeks, meeting with all of the, uh, the divisions within the library, just about all the staff, 
Um, and oh, there's probably been 12, 14, 15 meetings uh, so far with, with various groups so that we can understand what they do, how they do it, what they need to make their jobs more successful in, in serving the community, um, understanding what kind of events the library hosts and what other kinds of events they would like, like to host. So that is still a process ongoing and we will have f further meetings and, and it, it will result in a, a detailed program of the various spaces in the library, how they need to function, uh, their, their qualities, adjacencies, and that kind of thing. And then um, finally, an analysis of, of underutilized spaces, much of those in the basement. Um, understandable why they currently are underutilized, but we feel that they can be greatly improved to provide more space for library functions and, and, and library staff. So in, in addition to um, the programming study and the seismic studies that we're doing, uh, well, I guess this is one of our investigations, is really looking at uh, all the different possible ways that we could seismically improve this building and then trying to narrow down what's the best one for this particular uh, building. And so that's what we're doing with uh, KPFF's uh, guidance and, uh, of course, it was already mentioned with a technical oversight committee uh, helping to guide that as well. But at the same time, we're also assessing as much as we can of this existing building. So how are the existing building systems working? Um, was there enough air? What do we need to do to improve the, um, the energy use of them? And uh, you know, how, how do we improve the services um, for those existing buildings. And so really to understand that, we need to know what's there now. And so that's what we're, we're really going into great depths on. We're studying the accessibility. We've already mentioned to you several things that we know about. There's many other things that uh, we haven't talked about as well uh, that have to do with bathrooms and all these various little levels that go up and down uh, throughout the, the library. So really understanding how the building and the site work from an accessibility standpoint or how they don't work so that we can improve them. Uh, we've got uh, a historic resources uh, group is very close on finalizing their historic character um, uh, defining features report where they're identifying all the things that really matter to the building in um, uh, hierarchical preference so the things that are must keep these uh, as exactly as they are and certain things that might have been changed uh, that will surprise maybe everybody. Uh, just uh, I'll share one of those with you. The cork floor that everyone thinks is historic was originally cork but not this cork. So we will keep it cork but uh, it, it also means that this cork is not something that is um, has to be preserved exactly, which allows us the opportunity to improve the structure of those floors uh, in a, a more uh, greater variety of manners. Uh, we're looking for all the leaks. There's a few buckets around the, the library right now, and uh, that's always evidence of uh, the rain making it into places it shouldn't. And uh, so we've got a, a consultant uh, who's scouring the building for all those leaks so that we can uh, obviously repair them. Um, we're documenting the existing acoustics and uh, uh, we'll certainly look at ways, places that want to improve acoustics, but first we really want to understand, you know, what's there now? How did it compare to what Myron Hunt originally planned? There's some great documents that he wrote that uh, our letters telling us all about the acoustic plaster in the circulation hall is really quite fascinating. Uh, so um, that, that's a, a great step for us to uh, start with. And then uh, we've already talked about the 3D scan and the 3D model that will assist us. And all those drawings that you see are really there and lots, lots of good information for us to pour through. All right, so that's the end of that portion of our presentation. Now we get to the point where we really want to find out uh, from you uh, what you want. Devin, did you want to talk about this very intriguing slide here? I, I think this is, it, you know, much of our day can be coordinating engineers of 
the acoustics, the mechanical, and the structural all together. So sometimes it's nice to take a step back and think about the importance of this building and think about what the building has seen. So from 1927 to basically 2021, um, it saw a lot of history. A lot of people who have experienced the building are now working on the building. Um, and then it's kind of open to the community of what you think this building, once it's restored and um, brought back to life and given, in a sense, another you know, extended life, what do you think um, this building will see in the next hundred plus years? Just a, just a little teaser for you to, as you, you think about uh, what, what, do you, what do you think uh, will be going on? I don't know about flying cars, but we'll find out. I don't know if I want flying cars. That's a whole other environmental um, uh, study for uh, safe us to do. All right, but uh, we would like you to share your thoughts. So um, we threw some questions out there um, for you. And uh, we've got a little microphone for anyone who's uh, willing to uh, share your thoughts. And for those of you who are um, shyer and uh, less willing to share your thoughts, we will take your uh, comments uh, in a smaller group at, at the end of this all. But I see we've got a brief uh, Saul to start this off. Thank you for the question. The city is actively recruiting a new library director. I have thrown my hat in the ring, but it's up to the city manager as the hiring manager to decide who that is. And I can assure you that, that there is a lot of momentum behind this project and it means a lot to me. And even though my title is acting director currently, I, I, I wouldn't characterize any of the staff's work as timid in this regard. It's very important to us. And I, I see some alumni staff in the, in the room tonight that kind of demonstrate to me the commitment <laughs> that the staff has to this project. I'm happy to see them here tonight. But thank you, Mr. Farrar, for the comment. And, and I can guarantee you that we are committed to this and meeting a tight deadline that we need to meet to, to stay on track. But I know you have other questions. I appreciate the question. And you're right, the, the project timeline is on the website that um, I referenced earlier, um, PasadenaPublicLibrary.net. We are, in the, we are in the design phase of this project, which will be a two-year project. This part of the project is fully funded and will go take us through approximately summer of 2025. Pending funding, construction will start in 2025 and will take 30 to 36 months to complete. So that does take us, it is about five years that we're looking at till we, op till we open the doors again. There are important milestones that in the design phase that are also listed on the web page if you'd like to learn more. Deborah can probably speak better to what those milestones are. But yes, we, they, those milestones are published. That's excellent question, thank you. Yeah. And, and uh, that's also a great question. And uh, yes, as a part of our design process, we look at as many precedents as we can, both in this country and in other countries. Uh, and uh, Larry mentioned, that one of the things that is uh, definitely, um, I, I guess, standard fare at this point for libraries is that they're not just about books and they're not just about quiet places for study anymore. Although we do believe that books and quiet places for study are a very important part of a library. But there's a lot of other community functions that they serve and uh, that's uh, a part of what we're exploring in this programming phase and with the community uh, outreach and community input. Um, so yes, there are uh, a lot of things that we're learning from those other um, libraries um, and uh, we will bring them to bear on uh, this project. You got it. And, and and perhaps we can uh, separately meet so we understand uh, more about the pianos and what it takes to keep them in good tune. So, yep, thanks, thank, great, thank you for that. And, and that is all things that we are evaluating, uh, also with the help of our technical oversight committee to look at the various levels of protection and, uh, and exactly how we can do it. And, uh, I, I will say more to come on that. Uh, we, we are uh, making good progress on that uh, assessment. I'm just a little premature to share it at this moment, but uh, 
not not too long before we are able to share. Yeah, uh, and we'll we'll make sure that uh, if you stay plugged in with our uh, little newsletters and uh, with our events, we'll make sure that you're there. All right. Yeah. Thank you. So as as we uh, look to restore the library and renovate it, we're also looking at site improvements. That includes the parking lot. Um, if we can enhance the layout of the parking to gain additional space, that would certainly be something that we will, our design team will be looking into. Uh, with regards to, because we're not adding additional space as far as additional square footage, uh, you know, our, from a building code requirement, we will not be required to add additional s space. And obviously, we will look to see if we can maximize it within the site of the library that we do have available. Um, Beyond adding a parking structure and such, you know, that would be uh, probably a, a future consideration at this point. Uh, it's, it's about maximizing our site. It, that would be something of consideration probably, but not as part of this project. Um, as we design, we will be also refining and developing a cost estimate for this project for construction. And as of now, we don't have funding secured. So our priority would be to, you know, restore the building and the building systems. And uh, that may be a future capital improvement project. But at least we could do what, you know, what is possible on in a within the site as far as as a parking lot not a parking structure so i do appreciate um that feedback and input and we will take that into consideration thank you with the accessibility improvements will um, improve the ability for people to walk and bike and take public transit and be able to actually access the building um, in a more robust manner and strangely, there are several parking structures in a short walk from the library. And so I think that when we can improve the um, perception of, um, of how close they are and actually improve the accessibility, uh, that will also uh, allow, open up some greater opportunities for getting to the building as well. Sure, uh, happy to. So. And it goes back to one of the questions that the other gentleman was asking about, you know, are we looking at what other libraries are doing and are we aware of what is the standard going forward with libraries? And, uh, uh, and, and I don't want to uh, cause you fear, so let me also step back and say, one of the unique features of this library is that all of the walls that make those rooms that uh, you can see there, are all structural, so we're not removing any of them. All the partitioning of this building is going to, you know, fundamentally remain as you see it there because most of the walls are, are structural. So that character is certainly being maintained and will not go away. I think the question is, um, and some of these uses are already in the building, uh, you know, should there be an innovation lab? And, and what, is, what does it mean to have an innovation lab? And these are some spaces that wouldn't have been in a traditional library. It wasn't in this library when the library was first opened. Um, but they've made their way into what libraries um, offer as services. Uh, I think uh, Larry mentioned a makerspace. And a makerspace is a place where, and there are very broad definitions of what a makerspace is where you might have some uh, tools that uh, community members can go to the library to utilize, whether it's a sewing machine or some other uh, thing that will help with crafting or with the making of any object um, so that uh, everyone doesn't have to have their own individual whatever, so a sewing machine or a 3D printer 
or various uh, other um, such pieces of equipment. And these are becoming more common in libraries, and whether it belongs in this one or not is a question for uh, everyone to weigh in on. Um, so if there is a maker space uh, with a 3D printer or a sewing machine, it will be in a place where it's um, acoustically protected from those quiet reading rooms that we were just talking about. Um, but it doesn't mean the two can't coexist in the building uh, at large. So that's the type of thing we're talking about with new uses. And uh, 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 so it, it's open for discussion. So I, I think there are some things that are uh, seemingly sacrosanct. The uh, children's room is certainly not going to change from being the children's room. That's kind of got its place earmarked. Uh, various other things will will stay intact. The centennial room probably wants to remain the centennial room. So it, it's really not big changes. It's uh, more about looking at some of the other spaces and deciding are they best used as they are now or is there other things that would be beneficial for this library to also house? And maybe the answer is no. Maybe it's perfect as it is. Um, but it's something that we certainly want to explore so that we're doing the right job for this building and the community. Sure, that's just looking at how every space is used. So uh, how many uh, lineal feet of book stacks are needed and how many are provided right now? And uh, you know how, how many offices are needed and are they in the right location? And don't quote me on this number, but right now I think there might be like 10 different little toilet rooms uh, throughout the space. Those 10 little toilets, like, uh, you know, little, like not even toilet rooms, like literally, I, I was telling someone it's the definition of a water closet. It's like a closet with a toilet. And, uh, you know, th those are probably not, uh, A, none of them are accessible, and so they all have to change anyways, but it probably isn't a wise thing for us to have, you know, so much plumbing dotted throughout the building. So those are the types of, you know, small improvements that we're gonna be making. And we figure that out through our programmatic analysis. So we look at everything, how it's used now, and how the staff would wanna function in the future and see if we can uh, find some uh, efficiencies in the process. Yes, yeah, so, and, and we wish we could just compress everything enough to make that anniversary and the opening coincide. Probably not likely, but you know, it's all, always a goal. Um. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Kipp, and welcome tonight. Um, we are celebrating a 100-year anniversary this year. 1923 was the year Pasadena passed a bond measure to fund the construction of the Civic Center, which included Central Library, City Hall, and the Civic Auditorium, and which was the first building built? The library, right. So um, if you take a look in... Um, the newsletter for the library, you can see some really great pictorial timeline of that. So we're celebrating one of those anniversaries now. Yeah, we, we're unlikely to be open for the 1927 anniversary of the dedication of the building, but we'll acknowledge it in some way for sure. All right, what's happening with the collection right now? Thank you for asking that question. So as I said earlier, we're blessed that almost everybody in the city of Pasadena lives within a mile of a library. Most of us can walk to one, which is nice. All of those are still open. When Central Library closed in 2021, May of 2021, staff moved quickly to try to make as much of the collection accessible to the public as possible. The best way to do that is to get it on a shelf where people can browse the materials and see for themselves and check them out. So those high demand items, we tried to move into our branch neighborhood libraries. Central Library is by far our biggest footprint in the city. So not all of the collection will fit into those branch libraries, right? So what are we doing with the rest of those materials? We continue to buy bestsellers and new materials as, as they're released and get them into the branch libraries. But the existing collection at Central Library, um, some of it's moved here. This is, a, we um, have a, a lease with the Pasadena Unified School District that we um, have city functions here. The, is, uh, 
Fire department has a training academy. The police department has an after-school program. The PAL program is here. And our children's department has opened up shop right next door across the way. So the children's collection is moving there. Uh, we've got plans for the friends, like I said earlier, to move in here too. Um, if space allows, we will bring as much of the adult collection here as possible. Obviously, some considerations need to be made for the client, for what parts of the collection need what type of climate control. For example, you know, all those historic resource, resources that you may be aware in the Centennial Room, all of the um, local Pasadena history resources, we'll need to make sure that we bring them into a room with, with the right humidity and temperature control. We're make, um, for now, they are safely stored at Central Library getting those conditions, but the plan is to move them into a space such as here, when, when the upgrades can be made to, to have them at a space like this, this school campus. Um, parts of the collection that do not need that special climate control will be moved to um, the Rose Palace Warehouse, the city-owned warehouse on South Raymond. Um, we are in the process of making the upgrades that are needed there. Shelving's been installed, um, but we, we perceive a, a system where the collection will be stored there. It'll be like a distribution center where staff will, um, uh, a member of the public can get on the library catalog, find a book on the online catalog, request it, staff will go to the shelf there, put it on a van, drop it off at the neighborhood branch that's most convenient for you, and you'll get an email, email that the book is ready to pick up and check out. Um, so plans are underway to do that. It's a big logistical puzzle, and staff is doing an outstanding job preparing for that. And much of the collection has been um, made available online, and you'll see it online in the collection. Um, I think we started with fiction, with you know the hot titles in fiction, and we're digging into the nonfiction section now. So, I hope uh, I, have I left out any parts of your question, Mr. Kippen? No. For those in, in the audience that are not librarians, deaccession is an ongoing process. We it's a living collection where things become outdated, they become damaged. Um, Pluto's no longer a planet, it's an exoplanet, so we have to get out the kids' books that say Pluto's a planet. You know, like there are things happen where we have to manage that collection and, and make sure we've got the best, most relevant collection. So yes, we, we will continue to weed the collection like it's a garden to make sure, you know, we've got a healthy collection. But um, uh, we will be working hard with Deborah and her team to make sure we've got space for a browsable collection where people can come in and, and see, you know, see the collection that they've come to enjoy in the city. That's, that's what I'll tell you for now. And, and I want to hear from you and from others, you know, what does the library mean to you and what, what parts of the collection are not big enough and what do we no longer need? Those are the kind of things that we'll be, you know, planning for over the next two years so we can have the best library we can when we reopen. Yeah. And I, I love Libo Shmibos. Thanks for coming. I love Libo Shmibos. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 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 I will check with Taka and the friends of the public library. I think that I don't think there's one on the books, but we will publish it and off the shelf when it's when they have a date set. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we, uh, we recognize it as a, a big challenge and uh, we're up for it. Oh, thank you and thanks for the input. And I'm really glad you mentioned uh, community center as I probably should have used those words in answering a pre previous question, but that is probably the predominant way that people describe libraries currently and in the future yeah, is that they've taken on more of a community center role. And so exactly what that means, though, is what this group and your you know, fellow uh, residents uh, can help us define. So we are currently in the process of evaluating the different uh, seismic performance levels that we can upgrade this uh, uh, building to. And we have a technical committee that's um, comprised of um, uh, structural engineer practitioners, as well as, as Caltech engineering professors that are also advising on this, on uh, to what level of upgrade. As you know, um, bringing this building up to a new building standard could be very challenging just because we're constrained with the, the physical characteristics of, of the building and trying to pres preservation. So there's a balance there that we have to strike uh, in terms of the level of performance 
uh, and, and the historic preservation. And we're at the very beginning of those. And uh, again, it's not a decision made by one person. It's a, a group and a committee uh, made of, of, of several people that are experts in their fields um, in terms of, you know, from, from academia to a practitioner. So um, we're not at that level yet uh, to do that, but it's, rest assured, it's, it's gonna be a lot better uh, than it is today, uh, for sure. Thank you for that. Uh, very briefly, I'll say if there is a need for a microform reader in the short term, if you go to the library's website, you can request to make an appointment to um, come to our administrative offices to use a microform reader until they're relocated to a public location. We've got about 36 cabinets of microform readers that need a new home, and we don't have the space identified yet. But we can we can um, accommodate a request with some planning, um, and then. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot before my copiers. Yeah, we do have copy services, color, um, copiers in the other in, um, neighborhood branches, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank on which ones have color. Derek, none have color, so we got to work on that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll work on that. Thank you. Thanks for the comment. I'll say that is the Hastings Branch Library. It has a beautiful butterfly garden, and check it out. It's from, it's stunning right now. It's in bloom. Thank you for that comment. Yeah. Yeah, one thing that we are quite um, experienced at is uh, removing materials carefully to put them back in carefully uh, and taking good care of them in the course. And uh, we will promise to do a very good job with this as well. And, and it does take a, a special effort and historic resources group and uh, Gruen, uh, we did this on several other projects together, and uh, we will impose it on whoever wins the construction uh, award for this project, but uh, there will be a careful plan in place. Thank you for the comment, and I'll say, in the meantime, please call us, and we'll get, you, get people served one-on-one. -on -one. It is a big logistical puzzle to find the space for those materials, and, and it is a priority for us to do it. And you can imagine everybody has a part of the collection that's their favorite part, and it's, we can't do it with them all at the same time. But we, are, we do have probably about an average of one person a day come in to use a microform reader in our administrative offices. So those appointments are available now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your input. So I, I can't speak to the 10 years. What I can speak to is that I'm under contract to get this design done uh, within two years. So um, we, we will do that. Um, that is a, a for sure thing. And uh, um, one thing, uh, uh, and I appreciate your comment about don't lose sight of the, the forest for the trees. Um, or, you know, don't, did I say that backwards? Don't lose sight of the trees for the forest uh, in, in this case. We, we won't look so broad that um, we make this project unattainable. Um, that's not something that we would do. And uh, we, we are very conscious that the building's closed and people want to use it and we want to get this thing open. So um, all of that is very much on our priority. One thing I'll say, though, is um, we look to leverage opportunities so that when we're doing one thing to help the seismic design or the accessibility, that we're doing something else to help uh, in, in another way. And so, you know, if we're um, having to disturb one material to uh, provide a structural improvement, we will take the opportunity to put in some more wiring for, you know, whatever the needs are, you know, that type of thing. So uh, it's not that the uh, other upgrades will drive the schedule. Well, the schedule is really going to be driven by the seismic upgrade. It's what else can we do while we're already, you know, doing whatever we need to do to make that seismic upgrade work. And uh, so that's, that's kind of the minimum baseline. These accessibility issues are part of that baseline. Uh, they just, they have to be done. And uh, so those two things will drive everything else, but I, I think you'll find that th that's really the schedule driver. And in the future, uh, when we have more of these meetings, we'll try and get into some greater um, detail about what that construction schedule might look like and, and how that will all go. Uh, we do not want this project to be 10 years from 
anything. And uh, quite frankly, you know, the schedule that we're on and the schedule that was uh, mentioned earlier about the 30 to 36 months to build it, uh, that's, that's what we're really focused on. And we do think that's the shortest duration that's credible. Uh, even if we didn't do all of, you know, even if we only did the seismic and the accessibility, it's still going to be that, that length because of the size of this building and then speed with which some of those improvements can be made. Um, so then it's a matter of what else can we do at the same time. And, uh, but we, we are certainly focused on how we get this project, how, how we get this building back open and used by the public. Because that's its purpose in life, and that's really the most important thing. And we appreciate the fact that everyone loves it, and so do we. And uh, so getting, getting it back in use is top priority. Ah, oh, we have our ways. So uh, I, I'm going to say you're going to have to come back for our next community meeting when we can get into more detail. I, and we haven't started design yet, just to be clear. We're in this investigation phase. So um, the next community meeting, we'll have gotten into some design and we'll be sharing uh, with you. But uh, um, the, the answer is that's one of many, many, many things that have been investigated. So one of the approaches that we've taken, <laughs> and uh, our structural engineer has been very patient with us for doing so, is to really look at every single possible way there is to seismically improve this building and evaluate you know, the pros and cons of it. And uh, we, we are not at a point yet, as uh, Aldrin said, to... Uh, kind of figure to, to have made a decision that's in the works. It hasn't been made yet. One thing I will tell you is every piece of masonry will absolutely not be removed from this building. Um, uh, we couldn't maintain the roof and, and do that. The, the masonry is the structure of the building. So, well, it didn't have to Well, we we are not planning on dismantling this building and remove and rebuilding it. So that I commit to you, uh, to all of you, and uh, we are not planning on removing all the masonry from it. And we are planning, in fact, on doing very much the opposite of that, which is retaining all of the masonry that can be retained, but it certainly has to be improved and supported. And uh, that's the focus of our seismic studies right now. And uh, we will in relatively short order, be able to share more with you. There is a requirement in the city of Pasadena for all electric, yes. So that is something that we would plan on doing. Yep, you are welcome. Great, thank you for that input. And I promise you I'll get to the website address in just 10 seconds. Uh, maybe maybe 30. Um, so we have all these uh, commission meetings that we will be going to. Uh, some of Many of these are public, maybe all of them. Um, and uh, we welcome you to uh, listen in and participate in these commission meetings. This is all en route to us going to city council, where uh, the city council, for those of you who, uh, I think Chris mentioned this before, but who who didn't uh, hear her say this. Um, the city council has asked us to bring the seismic approach that we are uh, we come up with to them for their blessing and their approval. And that may not be exactly the right way to say it, but uh, close, pretty close. Um, so uh, they, they get uh, to uh, the last right of uh, uh, approval on that. That will happen in the summer. Um, we'll be um, showing up at various uh, events this summer, uh, so look for uh, a library booth where we will start to share more of our discoveries as we go. And then we're planning another town hall uh, meeting like this one in September, and at that time we'll have uh, some design to show you. So we're excited to uh, do that. We haven't done the design yet, so we're excited to do the design first and then, and then show it to you. And uh, that schematic design runs through the fall. So this is that website address, and there is a QR code for anyone who prefers to just come and snap a picture of the QR code. And uh, it's www, sorry for the blue, that made it not so easy to read, pasadenapubliclibrary.net.
So www.pasadenapubliclibrary.net. And that will get you access to all sorts of wonderful things. And uh, hopefully you will find everything you want there. And uh, can provide other comments if you have them. So uh, thank you all. This has been great participation. Um, <laughs> And anyone who has not shared, who wants to still share, we're going to be around for a little while. So please uh, come and see us, and we'll take your uh, comments uh, and questions as well. Thanks. Thank you, Deborah, and everyone. Uh, and I want to thank you all for spending this evening with us. And, uh, and I hope that you will uh, continue to attend our future meetings. We will, as Deborah said, have a lot more detail once we have a schematic design figured out for the retrofit. We should have a more detailed schedule on the design as well as going into construction. And I do wanna say the 10 years, I'm kinda curious to know where you heard that because that's definitely not a, a you know, any statement that I have heard before, nor is it coming from the city staff. So uh, I want to assure you that you have our commitment. Public Works, we are delivering this project and you're our client. We want to hear from you. We want, we welcome your input so that we can together, you know, it takes a village to build up every single project that we do. So the more uh, we can interact, the more successful of a project we'll have at the end. I also want to take this opportunity, as I mentioned, the city, this is a high priority project and the city has hired on a senior project manager. I want to introduce Teo Sierra. Some of you may have been in touch with him. He's our day-to-day -day working closely with all of the various departments, not only the library, but we work closely with planning and building and safety, uh, making sure all of the required, you know, this project will go through plan check and approvals, just like any other private development project in the city. And also all of the environmental reviews and approvals will be done, uh, you know, alongside with all of the design work. So um, with that, I don't have anything else to say unless you have anything more, Teo, to add. So the, um, there is uh, information on the flyer that went out, all the information in Instagram, all the information in Facebook, uh, newspapers has my name, my email address, and my phone number. So I was brave enough to give that to everybody. Any questions, any concerns, schedule, meetings, any, any information that you may need, you can email me or you can call me. Um, I will try to get back to you within reasonable time depending on what my schedule is for that day. Um, but um, you have that information. The, uh, the QR code is actually working, so if you scan it, um, all that information will be uploaded. In regards to the video, look at that. Uh, probably sometime in the next couple of days, we'll have that uploaded into the website. So. Um, thank you for coming, and um, we hope to see you on the next meeting. Okay, thank you.